My name is Norma Joan Frank, and uh, later on my name became Norma Frank Mann. And in between that, uh, when I was a bride, I would call my husband at the office and ask the secretary answering the phone for if I could speak to Mr. Mann, and she'd say, sure, uh, who's calling please? And I'd say, Mrs. Monowitz. And therein lies the tale of his boss, who had made many demands upon him as a freshman accountant uh, in terms of changing his name. And as long as he was expected to work under one name, we decided to legally change the name. Uh, so we were not encumbered with the two. I was born in 1929, October 12th. Uh, I was born in the Bronx in a maternity hospital uh, on the Grand Concourse. And uh, so this is a step beyond where seven and a half years previously my sister had been born on the kitchen table. And I ushered in the Great Depression. I was born in a building overlooking Yankee Stadium my father always loved baseball as a result of that. We could see the game from the roof of the building. Uh, so when they were playing one of their many World Series, he'd be up there you know, uh, on tar roof, you know, watching. My mother came to this country uh, at 12 uh, with her father and uh, one remaining older sister the rest of the children who were in the United States uh, wanted him and my mother and, sis and her sister uh, to come. So my mother uh, came not in steerage and uh, she said that it was one of the f most fun things that she ever did. She was a nosy little girl and she ran up and down. She said all the corridors and all the staircases to every level, peeking uh, and noticing. I can just picture her doing that. Now, so your father, when he came over, you say around age 15, was he by himself or with other family? No, he came alone. By then he had finished what's called uh, gymnasium, which is beyond our high school. And uh, he was not, obviously he was restless. And he was looking for a better life. Uh, my father came uh, as the oldest of four children. My mother came, uh, as I say, the youngest of more than nine children. My father's name is was Emery, Emery Frank, E-M-E-R-Y. In Hungarian, that would have been Imre, I-M-R-E. My mother was it's a funny story with that. My mother's name was Frances. And the reason she is Frances and she still is on her, on her tombstone is because my father, whom she ultimately married, uh, liked the name Frances. But her name uh, in Hungary was Fani, F-A-N-I. So when your parents started out in this country, how did they make a living? Well, my mother was a schoolgirl, and uh, we have pictures, which you may not see, uh, of her graduating from junior high school. And then she went off to work. And the reason she went off to work was, I think school was hard for her. The English was the second language. and. Uh, she wanted money, and nobody could give her money. So she went to learn a trade, and she went into uh, one of the garment factories. She became an exquisite seamstress, knitter, embroiderer, crocheter. There was nothing that she couldn't do with handwork. And she said she learned it at her mother's knee. My dad went to work. Uh, for this one uncle. They had a trimming and uh, yarn business. My father was a, a pussycat. 
He was a darling, gentle man. My mom had very high standards uh, in everything. She dressed us beautifully and she made most of our clothing because she couldn't afford to buy it. I think I was a typical kid, you know, I couldn't wait for my mom to come home from work. I can remember at five or six, you know, going down to the subway at around the time she's, you know, the station, she's going to be coming home just so that we can walk home together. Uh, you, we lived different kinds of lives uh, in the Bronx. You know, we lived in an apartment house. There was somebody who was responsible for me. In other words, I always had an adult. It was the wife of the superintendent. Uh, and, you know, she loved kids. And so I went to her for lunch, that kind of thing, when I was coming home from public school. And in my earliest years, uh, when my mother first started going to work, my tante, who lived uh, via bus, I think it was a trolley car before a bus, easily 30 minutes away from us. Every single morning, my mother took me to her older sister, this older sister, as I said before, there were three others, but this was uh, her second mother, and it was my second mother. She was childless. Very sweet lady. <laughs> wow, this is different than writing. What was her name besides your Tante? Matilda Winkler. And or Matild in uh, Hungarian. I probably was there from like three to five. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly remember, but I'll bet you it was, it was two years. And my mother's help was my big sister. So while I was, you know, romping around the street with my, the kids who lived in the, in the building, uh, my sister was probably upstairs already starting, starting our supper. Mm -hmm. I was a latchkey kid, which means I wore my house key together with my skate key around my neck on a piece of cord. Those are the only important keys. One was to the door of the apartment, and one was for your roller skates. And I love to roller skate. Uh, they were ball bearing skates, I remember that. And you needed the key to tighten the clips at the front of your shoes. I remember that. I had a doll carriage. And a few blocks from where we lived was a park. And that was a nice place to go. Did your family ever go on vacations in the summer or on school vacations? The first vacation that I really remember, uh, I was like four or five years old. And we went all the way to a farm in Colchester, Connecticut, very rural central Connecticut. Can you imagine all the way to Connecticut? We went to lake, a lake where we would swim. The mother sat on the shore. Uh, we'd run out uh, to have them pull the leeches off us and then jump back into the water. Uh, I went to the barn and I would pick eggs. I learned how to drink sweet cream rather than milk from the cows because I liked the taste even better than milk. Of course. <laughs> I was a skinny little kid, so <laughs> it didn't show on me. <laughs> it only shows now when I can't <laughs> drink sweet cream. <laughs> uh. Did you ever go to any of the beaches? The yes, city? as I told you, we, we used to have family picnics. Uh, and or I went to visit Tante who spent the whole summer out on the beach called Rockaway. Uh, so I would spend a few weeks with her. The picnics were neat because then we'd go with a couple of aunts and uncles and a couple of cousins. And my mother would be up at five in the morning starting preparing the food. 
and she'd make things like southern fried chicken and coleslaw and potato salad and we put it in a suitcase and then we carry towels and then we carry blankets to spread out and we'd go by subway, subway and then a bus and it probably was one hour of traveling and we'd come up to Westchester uh, Tool Park, which is still there. So that was vacationing. I forgot that one summer I was working as a mother's helper, and this was a phenomenal coup. This was before I went off to work, you know, at the day camp in the mountains. Uh, I had to go to Brighton Beach, which was one hour on two trains by myself. I was 12 years old. I spent the whole day with this three-year-old, nap, lunch, going to, the, going to the beach, cross the boardwalk, going back home, supper, and then this gal came home. Then I went on to this, back on the train and reversed that. When you went home, was it dark? Sure, sure. But Safety was never an issue. I would come home at two in the morning when I was a, an older teen and I would walk my girlfriends who lived far further away than I did from the subways and they were scared so I walked them and then I turned myself around and walked back. I really truly was fearless and I had no reason not to be. It was just another world. What about school? What was school like for you in elementary school? No, school was, was fun. I liked school. I was good in school. Uh, I uh, raised my hand a lot. Uh, the two of you are smiling. <laughs> I haven't stopped talking. That's all right. <laughs> And I went to the first year of junior high, to the exact same junior high school that Milt went to, believe it or not. Then I went to the junior high school that I graduated from. Uh, it was PS82, uh, McCombs Junior High. I went to high school, also a neighborhood high school called uh, William Howard Taft High School. In high school, by that time, we had clubs. I was in the biology club and I was in the radio club. By 15 and a half, I was in college. So how'd that happen? Instead of doing it in four years, we did in two years. Everyone was doing it in two years or? No, only if you were in the uh, first of the line of classes. Mm -hmm. It was a very different curriculum that we followed. I mean, we, we were, first of all, we were college bound. And second of all, if we were doubling up, we had to double up on what we were studying. Uh, Did that mean a longer day or a year? No, no, it didn't. But they had, we had the cream of the crop of the teachers who loved to teach. So, how did you decide where to go to college? I was helped in the decision making uh, by my sister. My big sister encouraged me to go to a co-ed school. And there weren't very many co-ed city universities. Uh, city college, as it was called, you had to be an education major. Uh, or an engineering major to go uptown, or a business major to go downtown. I wanted none of the three. My mother, of course, wanted me to be a teacher, so I'd have the summer off. I didn't want to be a teacher. Uh, I wanted to be uh, a social worker. So I went and passed the test for Brooklyn College, which is a co-ed school. It just happens to be an hour from my house on the subway. Uh, and at the time that I entered, the war ended. And the boys started coming back 
to school. I didn't realize it, obviously, up until that, until 1946. Uh, the boys were not in school, even if it was a co-ed school. And I, I was a sociology major. Did you do a lot of activities in college like you had in high school? None at all. None at all. Uh, I had to go to work. So I worked. If my program was such, I could work in the morning. I worked in the morning. I was forever working. Uh, I had what we called intercession jobs. We used to have a whole month off in the winter time. One year, I got a job uh, in Manhattan uh, in a lingerie uh, house, it was called. And in three weeks, I had learned three machines. I feel I'm handicapped now, but at that time, uh, it wasn't difficult. These were bookkeeping machines. They were not computers. And by the fourth week, I had a raise from $25 to $35. And that was such a huge amount of money. I went home and told my parents uh, that I was going to stay on the job, shades of my mother, and uh, go to school at night. And my father, who as I described earlier, was a gentle lamb of a parent uh, and was so supportive of anything I did, was adamant that I was not to do this. I had to go back to school full time. He said, you will never finish school if you go over into night school because you'll be too tired and you can manage without it. Uh, he knew whereof uh, he spoke. What would you say, looking back, was one of the happiest times of your youth? I have a hard time answering that. I almost have a feeling that I didn't have a youth. I didn't, I didn't have a childhood, uh, especially if I tell these stories, uh, in a sense. Uh, there's a lot of coming and going. Obviously, if I was playing with a girlfriend or, now, or I was roller skating in the park, I was quite free of any burdens. I learned to ice skate when I was seven. My big sister was taking me ice skating in my Aunt Julia's old ice skates. And she sat me down at the end of a, 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 the, a, a flooded uh, wading pool in the park near, near where we lived that was iced and put the skates on my feet. And then she and her girlfriend said, put me on the ice for the first time in my life and said, okay, we'll be back in about an hour or two. And they go trotting off. And I skated, <laughs> and I loved to skate. <laughs> As I said, I liked to be roller skating, so I, I had no trouble at that time. <laughs> and I was alone, and I was skating around and around till she came back. Not even with your girlfriends? No, nobody was there that I knew. So is that the greatest time of my life? Probably. Picking leeches off, was that the greatest time of my life? <laughs> Probably it was disgusting, <laughs> but everybody was shrieking, so it didn't matter. You know, uh, I remember having fun uh, cleaning the brass pipe underneath the kitchen sink. We did that every single week, every single week. Wow. My mother cleaned the kitchen windows inside and out and put up freshly starched curtains every single Friday. Uh, the routines of, of uh, order and cleanliness and neatness, uh, they were all tucked away in here. Mm -hmm. uh, and for many, many years, I've done what my mother did. I, I, I had experiences that were wonderful, and I know they're wonderful as I look back. Uh, I have no recollection 
of extreme joy. Uh, what about the other side? Any recollection of extreme sadness as a girl? Sometimes being alone. That skating at that time, and I, I don't recall it that way, must have been tough. <laughs> but I, I don't remember it that way. Uh, I'm very kind to myself. I, uh, I don't remember pain, uh, and I don't probably remember too many painful experiences. So how did you meet Milt? I met him on April 1st. If we're married 54 years, that's four years before that, so 58 years ago. And it was a Friday night, and it was a house plan fraternity party. And my girlfriend, who was a member of this house plan, wanted me to go with her to the party. And I didn't want to go in the worst way, because I had not set my hair. And it was the other excuse was my sister's birthday. Uh, but we went. And uh, I was righter than wrong, because it was dull. The music was going on in the hallway. And at 10 o'clock at night, or 9 o'clock, I don't even know when, Gillette Friday night fights, prize fights, got on the television set. So all the guys are standing in front of the TV watching the, the, the prize fight, and the music is in the hallway. So I asked my girlfriend, I said, let's dance, because I was so annoyed. And a guy tapped me on the shoulder, and we started a dance. And we left that party at the time that everyone left the party, and we walked home. We went to my house, and Milt and I stayed up talking till 3 in the morning. My father was out working. My father worked nights. And uh, whenever he came home, I don't know if it was three or it was four anymore, it was, it was very unseemly, I can tell you that. And there's this guy sitting with me whom he doesn't know. My mother's fast asleep. So Milt ran out of the house, literally. <laughs> Nice to meet you, Mr. Frank. <laughs> and bye, <laughs> how he went. And I went to sleep. <laughs> Next night, we went out on our first date. It was a Purim carnival down at his school. Uh, so that's how I met Milt. Do you remember what it was about him that interested you? We've never stopped talking. We're still talking. He was good looking, and he was bright, and he was funny. Uh, this guy was a good soul then. He was supporting a family and going to school. He was doing what he felt he had to do. And his sense of responsibility uh, is overwhelming as I reflect upon it. Now, uh, there are very few people, I think, that would do what he did. And he tried the, his father's business uh, to hold on to it. But that meant he couldn't go to school. And uh, he just realized that that was not what he wanted to do with his life. Uh, as I say, he was, he was wise, if not smart. And, we were married four years before Madeline was born, so you know we had plenty of time. And all those years, I was going to graduate school. I was going to uh, up to Columbia, the New York School of Social Work, and uh, I could have gone away to school, but I didn't have the courage to do that—to leave town and you know do it full time. Uh, I've wimped out on lots of stuff, uh, and uh, Milt was always there, 
encouraging and pushing. He never once said, don't do something. Never. Uh, so when you started working after finishing at Brooklyn College, where did you work? For the city of New York. Uh, and it was the Bureau of Child Welfare. It was the welfare department when I first started, but exclusively daycare with children. Uh, it was a neat job, actually. I worked uh, one day at the home office when you dictated all your work from four other days, and in the four days I was always in two nurseries. And you do all the intake and all the follow-up. So you recertify. And the, the student population that I worked with, uh, the kids, women who had to work, sometimes they were single parent families. Many were uh, what we call displaced new Americans. Barely spoke English. You made house calls. There were Hispanics. Uh, I worked one nursery in a Polish neighborhood right near the waterfront. And the dynamics in each of these communities was slightly different. I think I made $2,700 for the year. So what was your courtship like? You were both working. He'd work till 10 o'clock at night, and I'd meet him at the subway station, but his station. And then we would go walking to his apartment where his mother and his two kid brothers lived, and they had a television set. So there we were, all lined up on the couch, watching. <laughs> watching. Pretty romantic. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Television. <laughs> then when 11 o'clock or 11.30 came and it was time to go home, he'd walk me back home. Uh, he worked all day Saturday, so we had Saturday night to go out. So we went out every single Saturday night. And Sunday he got me a job so that he wouldn't be lonely. So we'd meet on the train. I was one station above him. The subway courting, you know, it was four years before we were married. Mm -hmm. And one year of that four years, of course, was the time we were engaged mm -hmm. and planning the wedding with my family. That was the worst time of our entire relationship, planning the wedding. Uh, I had two sets of invitations. My mother-in-law did not like the fact that I was Americanizing. We didn't have uh, mom's uh, name on the invitation. And she just went through the roof. So I had to have more invitations printed. So what was your wedding like and where was it? In a synagogue uh, very close to where we live. It was what I wanted. It was a buffet, and Mom, Milt's mother, wanted a sit-down dinner. Uh, there was no real economy. It was just, you know, I was in, more interested in the dancing, and, and I had a blast at my wedding. We danced our bloody heads off. Milt and I have danced a lot uh, through the years. We love to dance. And uh, it's, uh, you, you know, you don't dance on the subway. But Saturday night, you know, did it all. <laughs> what about your honeymoon? We had a lovely honeymoon. We went traveling by car. Milts had been given a 1942 Plymouth. Milt and his brothers. And we had to put one quart of oil into the car every 50 miles. And then we went all the way up to Canada. 
Quebec, province of Quebec. We really stayed at some very lovely places. And we had a lot of fun. I can still, to this day, remember the strawberries that we bought on the Ile d'Orléans, which was outside of the city of Quebec. It was a fun vacation. We uh, almost drowned on this fishing lake. My husband is an avid freshwater fisherman at that time, and he's trying to teach me to cast. And he, of course, gives me his best rod. And I'm standing with a plastic raincoat and a white sweater and white saddle Oxfords, and it is raining. And there we are in the middle, on, with a rowboat in the middle of this lake, and I cast, I stand up, and I cast out my rod, <clears throat> and the rod goes into the water. So I go after it into the water, totally dressed. <clears throat> and I had to get out of that water. And I could not, and I weighed 119 pounds, so it had nothing to do with my girth. I was very slender. I couldn't get into the rowboat. And I thought I was gonna drown. I hung on to the back of the rowboat and he rowed to the shore. <laughs> but it was a very nice honeymoon. And we really never stopped traveling. We've done a lot of traveling, Milton and I. Uh, and until I got crotchety. Uh, and we are now talking about resuming that because I'm not crotchety anymore, we think. Do you have any traditions associated with your anniversary? My husband has one. He knew I loved flowers. So my first wedding anniversary, he gave me one rose. Second anniversary, two roses. And this year, I have 54 roses. And I have pleaded with him, start going backwards. And he absolutely will not do it. How do you think being married to Milton has affected your life? He keeps me, who uh, is a uh, very square person, serious beyond need, uh, laughing. Uh, I still can be teased. I still don't know when he's teasing. Uh, I laugh at his jokes. He has confronted certain uh, life-altering experiences. And I've been there alongside of him. And his ability to overcome them uh, and to find a joy in living it has to be somewhat contagious. Uh, he also, uh, from being a very poor boy, and I mean poor, uh, is a very successful man. Uh, by dint of his ability. He tells the story that when we were married, I had uh, $6 in the bank, something like that. I mean, some absurd, no, you know, but that I did come to him with five dozen uh, dish towels in my trousseau. <laughs> um, did you always know you wanted to have kids? And oh, yes. Was there a certain number you wanted Yes, to have? we wanted five children. Mm -hmm. uh, and we stopped at three because we had sense and we realized it was a huge amount of work. We have three of the greatest kids. I adore my children. They are the goodest people on this earth. Uh, nobody could be blessed with better. They are givers. Uh, they're humanists, and uh, that's a very special quality. 
what has what has being a parent meant to you? Somebody to tell you stories to. The teacher that I never began, the girls used to say when we went traveling, and we did a lot of traveling with the children, uh, and they are continuing it uh, without us, uh, that you should have been a teacher. I love being the tour leader, and I used to be the tour leader. Uh, we didn't do organized things, we, we just, you know, designed a, a program and off we went with them. Kids have had a, a good life, they, they too. Uh, they've done more or less the things that they had wanted to do. What were your girls like as kids? My firstborn who was very close to the second, was angelic. She was so good, it's scary. And it took her a long, long time, you know, to feel that maybe, you know, uh, she could rebel too. And it's, it's hard to see because remembering how she was when her sister Laura was born. She would sit at my knees in a rocking chair. And as I was nursing the baby, the second one, we'd read books to her. And it was great. Laura was uh, probably the most difficult of our little ones. She was uh, a little more ornery, a little more grumpy. We used to call her uh, some, a name that her, my mother-in-law gave her, uh, Mushka Dick. Doesn't mean anything, but you know, she would, her lip would go out in the front like this. Now, she was sulking. Uh, the third one was the classic baby. Uh, she had the best of all possible worlds. She got away with things that the firstborn could not possibly have gotten away with. I think parents, uh, Madeline has alluded to it, were tougher on firstborns. It's not done in an absence of love. That's what's so amazing. What are they like as adults? Good caring parents and good caring citizens. They treasure the earth that we live on and really try in their own way uh, to make a difference. Uh, I once said to a friend, I don't know where our kids come from social workers and midwives and nurse practitioners. These are people who don't make a living. They love what they're doing and they're desperately needed. So my friend said to me, Norma, you are really stupid. What have you been doing all your life? Uh, Milton and I would have it no other way. We, we try to do what we think is the right thing. We realize that we have been ha given a gift, and that gift is a degree of success. So that's not just playing and not just going to the tennis matches and stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's caring about others who are in need. Uh, and I guess, I guess we showed it more than we talked it. So I'm very proud of that. And by the way, their children show it. 
Pamela was in the Peace Corps for two years. It, it's just, you know, my husband serves on countless boards. I have served on countless boards. Tell me a little about that. How did you get started volunteering? I got started because I, I couldn't just be a parent. I, I had to get out. It was just where the mother was needed, uh, you know, I volunteered and the next thing you knew, you're doing the next thing and the next thing. They've been experiences and uh, I'm much richer uh, for it as a person, I know that. Tell me a little about the United Jewish Federation. It sounded like you were very much involved in getting that going. Yes, I was. I, Milt and I uh, were in a young leadership group bringing it to town as such. And uh, I've been the first woman president of, of bunches of stuff. Uh, that's again, because I'm not opposed to opening my mouth when I feel that there's an injustice, as it were. Uh, so I, I ended up with a lot of service in, in the Federation, ladders, but I was the first uh, woman president uh, in Stanford. I was the first person on the uh, board of trustees of Temple Beth El. They had to write a new constitution for that. I have daughters and the 60s was the time they were growing up. And I guess feminism uh, rubbed off. I wasn't a militant, but I, in my own way, I was a militant. Uh, I didn't carry banners, uh, but the statement that I made took me into the place where you know I ended up being the first, uh, and that's not an easy thing to do. I liked being the at-home mother, I think. Uh, I'm good at it. I, I, run a, I ran a nice home. Uh, I was a tough parent, like my mother. A parenting time that was tough for you, what was it like taking care of your dad when he was sick and dying and you had three little kids at home. I went into New York every single day to so be with my mother. Did you put kids on the bus? No, nope. I relied on girlfriends. The morning, morning I had a day worker uh, once a week, but the other uh, four days uh, I had girlfriends. He was 72. I was sorry about the things that I never asked him. Uh. How did the death of Connie's husband, Cal, and then Milt's brothers, Urban Kenny, how did all that affect the family, and how did you deal with that? Life goes on, you just said. Children are resilient. We are resilient. Uh, I remember when Ken died, uh, it was just before New Year's. It affected that first New Year's profoundly. There's no question that your life is affected by each person you lose. The best image I could give you, because it is the newest image, my mother would be 106. Yeah, she died at 98. She died, you know, the m minute we were, we were coming home from Louisiana with, with Elena. Madeline had to turn around, she get off the plane and, and literally the next morning with her newborn baby, come down to a funeral. My mother's casket was in the front of our synagogue. And before we walked in out of a small room where people were visiting with us, we looked into the sanctuary and there 
where all the grandchildren were running around the coffin with their hands on the coffin. I cannot get that picture out of my mind. That was so beautiful. They weren't frightened. It was, you know, they knew she was a very elderly lady. They didn't show any particular trauma. Uh, they were playing. And that's what I remember. What was it like having her up here? It was much harder, but it was the rightest thing, rightest thing on earth. Uh, and that again, a girlfriend. Remember I told you about moving here? Another girlfriend said, Norma, you're looking for places where your mother might be. Bring her to where you are so that you're not going to be in living in the car. And it was harder for my sister, who lived close to her. She had a new husband, so she couldn't go all the time. All yeah. the time. I had nobody in the house. Uh, pop in mm -hmm. for 20 minutes. Uh, you know, have lunch once in a while. But you take her out, want to shop. It's hard to see uh, a parent. Uh, see, I didn't see this with my father. It was one year and he was gone. Mm -hmm. What about more recent losses? How have more recent events in the family affected you? Oh, the last two years are the banner years, my dear. Starting with your brother's surgery. <laughs> Much harder when you're a parent and you see the children going through hard times. And now Laura is so cheerful, is so at peace and so contented with what she is in this state of grace, as it were where she has placed herself. It's not happening from nowhere. She's making it happen. How dare I cry? She's sharp as a tack. And she did what she wanted to do. She mothered and played the entire summer and worked. Where do you find your strength to get through some of these things? my belief in the divinity of people. God is with us. I don't believe our God singles people out. Life is for the living. Nobody, very few people, certainly not nobody, shrivel up and die. We talk. And that's very therapeutic. If, if that is strength, then we have it. Uh, I think that some of the strength has come from Laura herself, though. And yet we have made it very clear to her. Uh, that we can cry together. And we did that many, 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 many months ago when her leg was, had just been fractured. Mm -hmm. But she's, she's done so much, you know, since. I have that picture of where they climbed the mountain, the three girls with Madeline, they put a crown on her. But for Laura to have done that climb, it is utterly amazing how somebody could do that and have a leg like that. What's it like to be a grandparent? Neat. <laughs> There's the, the problem with, with geography. I feel cheated. 
I really feel cheated. Uh, I know I have acquaintances, obviously, whose kids live, you know, so they can see them once a week or once in three weeks or whatever. Uh, and it's a much bigger deal. So what do you do to bring the family together? We have been traveling with the entire family every other year for probably a decade. Uh, the last trip we did uh, was a year ago, this winter, and we went to the Galapagos. And uh, the word awesome appeared then, and the kids and my children really loved it. If you had your life to do over, would you do anything differently? That's a loaded question. Yeah, I wouldn't be so serious uh, if I had it ought to do all over again. Uh, one never had, can go back, Kathy. So to say, you know, if I had it to do over again, yeah, I would be a better skier. I would be, you know, more of an outdoors person than I have been. Uh, yeah, that, that, that sounds nice, uh, but it ain't gonna happen. You only go this way once. You try to put as much into it as you can. I have three children who adore the theater. I have three children who love life, who love to dance, who love to sing, some of them superbly. Uh, who love parenting. Uh, my cup runneth 